few yards further on, I was nearly knocked down by a tremendous blow on the upper right arm and spun sideways. Even then, no thought of death came. Only some phrase like sledgehammer blow from a serial read years before in a boy's magazine. Pain came the next moment. The spurious self-hypnotism vanished and gave way to an overwhelming desire to run. Anywhere. Not so far down as the well, and a gap was a ghastly shambles. Some 300 desperately wounded men had somehow congregated there. No one appeared to be responsible for them. Their wounds were uncared for, and in the heat, some of them were in such a shocking state. They had no food, no water, except what was given to them by the passers-by. And so many of them were hit a second and a third time as they lay there helplessly. Alongside me, there was a poor Aussie boy who had been shot in the head and had bandages all around his head and blood that trickled down. And he was more or less delirious. And every now and again, he would stumble to his feet and wave a trench and tall handle and shout out, Kill the bastards! Kill the bastards! Eventually, in what I took to be a sane moment, he said to me in a hoarse voice, Have you got a pencil, Cobber? Somebody gave him a pencil, assuming, I suppose, that he might want to write goodbye to somebody, but all the poor fellow wanted it for was to lever the bandages up from his head because they'd become too tight and his face was smeared with mucus and stuff. It was horrible, really. Moaning softly, huddled on his knees and his face sweating his agony, he yet smiles with his eyes too when he looks around. Right wrist and hand smashed, big gash in right thigh and flesh wound in the neck. Put on field dressings. Whatever is pain, he won't make your job harder by showing it. Thanks you in a pleasant voice and settles down to wait. Hours, probably, for the stretch of errors. You feel like choking to see their gameness. Reports say that Wellington is practically wiped out. It is certain that half of our men are killed and wounded. We're short of stretchers. Some of the men are going down on their hands and on their sterns, shot in both feet. Some are carried down. Blinded men are led down. This is a theatre of carnage. Stretcher bearers, prospering and exhausted, after having delivered their load, go out again, through the artillery barrage, to a place where they knew that more wounded were lying and waiting to be picked up. And frequently, enemy soldiers were among those they brought back. I operated all day and all night. Our dump ran as high as 80 waiting. At one time, we were 36 hours behind the list waiting on the stretchers for operation. Each day of delay was marked by the noise of saws in the waiting room. Many were lost on account of the gas gangrene of delay. It is not so hard to see a man die as to break the news to him that he will be blind and dumb for the rest of his life. And that was something we had to do often in that silent ward where only one in ten patients could mumble a few words from the shattered jaws. For the facial wounds were in many respects the most serious of the war casualties.
Operation, 17th of October 1918. The pedicle of the new lip was divided at the left angle, opened up and then converted to free flap attached to the left angle of the jaw. A long flap was next cut from the scalp, extending diagonally backwards.